Thank you, Joel and Anthony. That was beautiful. Welcome back, ladies. Hope you all had a great spring break. We are glad that you are back with us this morning. We're going to have a special time of corporate prayer this morning, led by our prayer chairman, Christy Schmidt. So, Christy, come on up. I hope that you will just enjoy this time to reflect and meditate and pray along with our prompts. Hey, good morning. I love that song so much. It's been going through my head on repeat for days now. I want you to know that each of you have been prayed over weekly in Jesus' name. Our servants team prays over you all collectively and your core group leader prays for you and your individual needs. This morning I'm gonna lead us again in a time of corporate prayer. As we did in the fall, I will lead you through a time of confession, adoration, thanksgiving, and supplication. James 5.16 tells us that the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. As I prompt you, you will pray silently where you are, creating a beautiful symphony of prayers to our Heavenly Father. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you that you are El Shema, the God who hears and the God who listens. Confession. 1 John 1.9 tells us that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Take a moment to silently confess any areas of sin in your life. Adoration. Philippians 2, 10 through 11 reminds us that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Take the next few moments to silently praise God for who he has shown himself to be in your life. The screen will have some prompts if you need them. Thanksgiving. In Psalm 103, 2, King David says, Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. Let us take time to thank him silently for all that he has done. Thank him for the truth of his word. the freedom to study his word. For answered prayers. For the forgiveness of your sins. For healing for yourself or for those around you. And for the people in your life. Psalm 143 1, King David begs, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. 
Answer me in your faithfulness, in your righteousness. Take this time to set your requests before our loving Father. Pray for the trials that you might be experiencing right now. church and the spiritual leaders in your life. Leaders in our city, our state, and our country. of Community Bible Study. Your commitment to Community Bible Study for next year. persons that you might invite to join you next year at Community Bible Study. And our country link, the country of Rwanda that the study of God's word would help create and strengthen disciples of Jesus. God, you are our good, good Father. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In your precious, precious name. All right, ladies, thank you for joining me this morning in this time of prayer, and you're dismissed to your core groups. Well, hello and welcome. Glad you are here today. Our children have a fantastic lesson. They are learning the story of when Peter and John healed a, look at those little ones, how cute. When Peter and John healed a lame man, their story comes from the book of Acts and also the book of Matthew. And the aim is to teach the children that God has the power to heal today just as he did when he healed the lame man. So it's a wonderful, wonderful lesson they have. We want to thank Wendy Duncan's core group for serving back there. They are holding babies and cutting out crafts for us, and we are so grateful for your service. So thank you very much. Our children are happy to be back after a week away at spring break, and I hope you are happy to be back, and I hope that you are refreshed and ready to finish strong as we open this tiny little book of Colossians that is just filled with such rich teachings and treasures. We are in the home stretch of Bible study, ladies. Remarkably, we only have five weeks left before we're going to break for the summer. And so this five weeks, though, is going to be packed with tremendously insightful scriptures as we open the book of Colossians. But this is the home stretch. And ask any athlete that you know, the home stretch is probably one of the hardest parts to finish, right? Because we're a little tired, we're a little weary. Some of us are a little distracted with things that are going to be happening all spring long. But I would just encourage you to finish the race that God has set in front of you. God has called us all to finish this Bible study, right? We committed to it. Finish strong, ladies. Run this race with endurance and finish strong. 
as we focus on finishing strong this year, we can't help but eagerly look forward to next year in, with anticipation, right? And that's what we started today. We, st we opened our registration for next year. I hope you are um, excited about that. Um, I highly encourage you to register early as we do anticipate we will have a waiting list once we get to September. So make sure you get registered early. As discussed in your core groups, registration is easy peasy. It's just a click of a few buttons on your computer or on your phone. Uh, but ju I, just one word of caution, I want to make sure you register for the right class. We've got four different classes. We've got a morning online Tuesday, a Tuesday evening online, a Tuesday evening in person, and a Thursday morning in person. So make sure you click and you get registered in the right class, okay? If you have any questions about registration, we're going to have Lori Witt, who is our coordinator. She'll be standing right down front when we're finished. Just come up and ask her anything, and she can help. She could even help walk you through the process right there, and you can get registered before you leave today. Um, now, if you have friends that you think might enjoy doing Bible study and would benefit from what you benefit from each and every week, we will be having our annual Visitor's Day. That's coming up. Visitor's Day is a day where you can invite friends, family, guests. If you are inviting them for our Visitor's Day, which will take place here at Second Baptist, you can invite them to bring their babies from newborn all the way up through um, uh, kindergarten. And so they can come with uh, their mamas that day. And your guest, when she comes, will be able to sit with you during the opening time. We'll have a special day of opening that, that day. She'll be able to sit with you during the teaching time. And when you go to your core group to discuss your lesson, we are going to treat those guests very, very nicely. We're going to take them into the parlor, and we're going to feed them some yummy treats. And we're going to tell them all about CBS and what CBS is all about and what we do here. And we will give them an opportunity at that time to register for our fall class. Um, our visitor's day, as you can see, we have cards. So if you didn't get one in your core group, we have some extras up here. Grab one of these cards, share it on social media, hand it to a friend, give them out, get them out in the public. We want to see um, this all over the place because we know that it's going to be an amazing study next year. And um, the more people that can be in the word, the better it is. And so we just want you to invite all your friends to come. Um, so we are busy. It is busy here at CBS. It's busy in your life. It is a busy time of year. And I hope that this week you have been busy diving into this first chapter of the book of Colossians. A basic summary of this first lesson, if we just kind of want to summarize what this first week of Colossians is about, is Paul is writing this letter to the, the people, the faithful people in Colossae, and he says, look, I am thrilled to hear from my friend Epaphras that the gospel message, and he says, puts a little aside in there, the gospel message that is spreading all around the world, by the way, he says, I'm thrilled to hear that it is bearing fruit in your lives. Paul also says that because it's bearing fruit in your lives, Timothy and I are constantly praying that you're going to be able to stay focused on hearing God's will and so that your lives will be pleasing to him. What an encouraging message that is. Not just for the church at Colossae 2,000 years ago, but for each one of us here today. The believers of Colossae are leading lives that are pleasing to the Lord. They are walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. And the challenge for each of us is can the same be said about your life? Can the same be said about my life? Am I walking, are you walking in a manner that is worthy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for these amazing scriptures. I thank you for the introduction to this book and these opening, encouraging words that Paul gives to each one of us. Let us be women who seek to know your will and then apply that will as we live a life pleasing to you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Okay, so we're going to do something this morning. We're going to take a little time. Um, we've done this uh, occasionally when we introduce a new book. We're going to um, have a video from uh, the Bible Project. It's about a nine-minute video. And what these video, this is the guy that talks really, really fast, and he draws um, really fast. And you can take notes, or you can go online this evening. It's BibleProject.com, all one word. It's free. You can just look it up. But it, this is just such a great overview of the book of Colossians. It, it's, he does it so much better than I could ever do it. And so we're going to look, watch this in order to also get a little context of why Paul is writing this particular letter at this particular time to these particular people. So uh, grab your popcorn and let's watch the video. Paul's letter to the Colossians. It was written during one of Paul the Apostle's many imprisonments for announcing Jesus as the risen Lord. And the letter is addressed to a group of people that Paul had never met who made up a church community that he didn't start. This church in Colossae was started by a co-worker of Paul's named Epaphras, who was actually from that city. And Epaphras had recently visited Paul in prison, and he updated him on how well the Colossians were doing overall, but he also mentioned some of the cultural pressures tempting them to turn away from Jesus. And so Paul wrote this letter to encourage the Colossians to address the issues that Epaphras had raised and then to challenge them to a greater devotion to Jesus. The letter's design and flow of thought are pretty easy to follow. The opening movement focuses on Jesus as the exalted Messiah. Paul then goes on to show how his suffering in prison is for the exalted Jesus. And then he addresses the pressures tempting the Colossians to turn away from Jesus. After this, he explores the new way of life that Jesus' resurrection opened up for them. So the letter opens with two prayers. Paul first thanks God that he learned from Epaphras that the Colossians have been totally faithful to Jesus, showing love for God and their neighbors, all because of the hope they have in the new creation that Jesus has in store. And so he moves on to pray that they would grow in their wisdom and understanding about Jesus. And then Paul has placed a poem here to help the Colossians and us do exactly that. It's the centerpiece of chapter one, a poem all about the crucified and exalted Messiah. It has two parallel stanzas, and it's crammed with language and imagery from the books of Genesis and Exodus, from the Psalms and the Proverbs. The first stanza explores how Jesus is the true image of God. In him, the full character and purpose of God is embodied in a human. He's the firstborn, an Old Testament phrase about Jesus' royal status over all creation. He shares in the very identity of the one true creator God. And by him, all reality, all powers and authorities, spiritual and human, have been created. It's in Jesus the Messiah that we discover the very author and king of creation. And so in the second stanza, we discover he's also the one bringing about a new creation. He's the head of a new body, which refers to Jesus' people, who are the new humanity, of which his own resurrection existence is a prototype. In him, God's glorious temple presence dwells. And so it's through Jesus' death and resurrection that God has reconciled himself to humanity, to all spiritual powers, to all of creation. It's a remarkable poem, and Paul will keep referring back to it as he goes on in the letter. So he first shows how the truth of this poem transforms his own experience of suffering in prison. He's being punished for announcing to the Greek and the Roman world that Jesus is the resurrected Lord and King of all. And so his suffering, he thinks, is not a sign of defeat. It's actually his way of participating in Jesus' own suffering done as an act of love. And so his hardships are actually a cause for joy. He's imprisoned for the surprising news that Israel's resurrected Messiah is creating a new multi-ethnic family. And more, just as the divine glory dwelt in Jesus, so Jesus dwells in and among his international family. Or as Paul says, the Messiah is in you all, the hope of glory. Paul then addresses the cultural pressures that are tempting the Colossians to turn away from Jesus. They were confronted by a combination of mystical polytheism along with a pressure to observe the laws of the Torah. 
So all these new Christians, they had grown up worshiping the various Greek and Roman gods who governed different arenas of human life, and many simply included Jesus as one more deity that they could worship. There was also great pressure from the Jewish Christian community for these non-Jews to complete their commitment to the Messiah by following all of the laws found in the Torah. Specifically, he mentions eating a kosher diet, observing sacred days, and circumcision. It's very similar to the problem he addressed in the letter to the Galatians. For Paul, to give in to either of these temptations is compromise. It's a failure to grasp who Jesus really is and what he did on their behalf. The Colossians used to live in fear of spiritual powers and elemental spirits, as Paul calls them. But Jesus triumphed over these. Through his death and resurrection, he freed the Colossians from any obligation to them. In the same way, Jesus fulfilled on our behalf all of the laws of the Torah, which never had the power to transform the selfish human heart anyway. And so what Jesus did in his life and death and resurrection, it lacks nothing. It doesn't need to be supplemented by following the laws. He is the reality to which all of the laws of the Torah were pointing anyway. Instead of the laws, followers of Jesus have the power of his resurrection to change them, which is what he goes on to explore. Following Jesus means joining his new humanity because their lives have now been joined to the risen Jesus' life. And this is why Paul challenges the Colossians to set their minds on things above, where the Messiah is seated or rules at God's right hand. Now, Paul doesn't mean here, think about how you'll one day leave earth and go to heaven. Rather, the heavens are the transcendent place from which Jesus rules now over all of creation. And from there, he will one day return here to transform all things. Or, as Paul says, when the Messiah who is your life is revealed, you too will be revealed with him in glory. So Paul challenges them to live in the present as the kinds of new humans they will one day become. He uses the image of their old humanity, characterized by distorted sexuality and destructive speech. For Christians, that humanity died with Jesus and has been replaced by his own new humanity, which is characterized by mercy and generosity, by forgiveness and love. And this humanity, it transcends the ethnic and social boundary lines of our world to create, in Paul's words, a people where there is no one Greek or Jewish, circumcised or uncircumcised, slave or free, but the Messiah is all and is in all people. Paul then gets really practical and he shows the Colossians what this new humanity might look like in a first century Roman household, which was a highly authoritarian institution where the male patriarch held the power of life and death over his wife and children and slaves. Not so in a Christian household. Here, the risen Jesus is the true Lord. And so, in the Lord, the wife allows her husband to become responsible for her, and the husband is subject to Jesus by loving his wife and placing her well-being above his own. In a home where Jesus is Lord, children are not objects but are called to maturity and to respect, and parents are to raise their children with patience and understanding. Christians who are slaves are to honor their human masters precisely because they're not the real master. Jesus is. And Christians who have slaves are to understand that this slave is not their property, but rather a fellow member of Jesus' body to be honored and embraced in love. And Paul's walking a very fine line here. He is reshaping the most basic Roman institution around Jesus who rules by his self-giving love. And so while he doesn't abolish the household structure out Right, the exalted Messiah demands that it be transformed, almost beyond the point of recognition for any Roman living in Colossae. You can see this most clearly in the letter's conclusion. After a request for prayer, Paul applies these instructions about Christian slaves and masters. And we discover that Tychicus is the one carrying and reading this letter to the Colossians. And he's accompanied by a certain Onesimus, who was a former slave to a Colossian Christian named Philemon. And we discover from another letter addressed to Philemon that Onesimus had escaped from his master. It was a crime worthy of imprisonment. But Paul asks the whole church to greet Onesimus as a faithful and beloved brother in the Lord. And then in the letter to Philemon, Paul says that he should receive Onesimus no longer as a slave, but as a brother. Talk about ending the letter with a punch. So in the letter to the Colossians, 
Paul is inviting us to see that no part of human existence remains untouched by the loving and liberating rule of the risen Jesus. Our suffering, our temptation to compromise, our moral character, the power dynamics in our homes, all of it must be re-examined and transformed. We are invited to live in the present as if the new creation really arrived when Jesus rose from the dead. And that's what the letter to the Colossians is all about. Couldn't have said it better myself. I'm glad he said it. Uh, those are great. Again, bobbleproject.com if you want to watch that. Um, okay, so just one more piece of um, history to give you a little context. I always like to know um, when we're looking at a book where, where we're talking about geographically. So we have a map, Col Colossae, you can see it way over there. We have Italy, this would be Greece, this is modern day Turkey, it was known as Asia Minor back then. So it's about 100 miles east of Ephesus, okay? Um, and we'll study the letter to the Ephesians next year, so that's where we'll be in, in Ephesus. But uh, Colossae is 100 miles east, and so if you remember about um, a month ago, the terrible earthquake that hit over in Turkey, um, I think it was probably in, in that area. Um, so this is where Colossae is. This is where he's writing this letter to these people. And like you heard in the video, in all likelihood, Paul had never been to this church. He had never met any of the people in this church, with the exception of Epaphras, okay? He had met Epaphras because Epaph Paul is the one who had led Epaphras to Christ through his teaching. And so he had that relationship with him. And now Epaphras is leading this church there in Colossae. And he has gone to see Paul. And he's, he's telling him, oh my goodness, these people in Colossae, they are so faithful. They get it. They have surrendered their hearts and their lives to Jesus Christ. Which is really quite remarkable considering all the false teaching that is coming in at them from every different direction. Okay? So these people, these Colossians, were walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. And to that, Paul says, verse 3, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. So Paul and Timothy are praying for these people. They've never met any of these people. They don't know them by name, but they are praying for them, and they are praising and thanking God for these people's thank, for, for their faithfulness, right? So Paul immediately links thanksgiving with prayer. He links them together, kind of like two wings on a bird. You can't, the bird can't fly with just one wing. He's got, he links them together. One has to be joined with the other. Thanksgiving goes with prayer in Paul's mind, and it should for all of us. And Paul continues and lists three reasons for giving thanks for, to God for these Colossian believers, verses 4 through 5. He says, we heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. So he says, I'm, we're, I'm thankful and I'm praising God for your faith, for your love, and for your hope. This is kind of a, a triad of, of different Christian virtues that Paul uses throughout many of his letters that he writes. And it's three traits of Christian virtues that should be exhibited in each one of our lives as well. Notice Paul begins with faith. Because faith is the beginning of the process, right? Now, lots of people have faith. Most people have faith in something. But faith in what is what's important? Faith in rituals? Faith in doctrine? Faith in our own goodness? Paul spells it out very clearly. He's thankful that they have faith in Jesus Christ. Now, the biblical, in biblical vocabulary, the word faith or belief is a very, very strong word. It, it really is. And faith or saving faith begins in the mind when we understand the truth of the gospel. And then it has to travel to our heart to where we are convicted and we understand our need for salvation. But it's only when we surrender our will to his will and bend our knee to the sovereign Lord Jesus Christ that that process becomes complete and we are what is known as saved. And that is the process of faith coming to saving faith. A man by the name of John G. Patton 
was a missionary back in the early 1900s. And he was stationed on some remote islands in the South Pacific. And he was charged with translating the Bible into the native language of those people, of those islanders. And so he struggled for a long time with trying to find the right word for faith or belief. And after um, much prayer and discernment, he came up with the word that really reflected to lean your whole weight into something. So that's that's really what a a good picture, a good description of faith, to lean your whole weight into Jesus Christ, to go all in for Jesus Christ. So faith is the first step. And faith is in Jesus, it should and it, it really, it must produced fruit just like uh, many of us on spring break we spent time out in our yards trimming bushes and um, as you're trimming up the the dead growth from last year you saw the buds the new growth coming out the fruit that was being produced right similarly a, a healthy believer who is actively growing in their faith will be producing fruit for the kingdom of God of which the most important fruit would be, could be argued is love. Love. Now, the idea of producing fruit and that fruit being love was an, a, an idea that was very contrary to what the false teachers were saying. The false teachers are teaching that evidence of your faithfulness, evidence of your spirituality is by if you follow all the rules, if you check all the boxes, if you um, have this super spiritual knowledge, which we've talked about this before, the false teachers, some of them were known as Gnostics. They were teaching Gnosticism, which was a really off-base idea of um, knowledge that if you study enough, if you check all the boxes enough, if you're righteous enough, then God is going to impart into you this super special secret knowledge that only you are going to have, right? And you will be elevated. And so this is how um, the false teachers are saying, this is the evidence. If you get to this super spiritual, uh, if you check all the boxes, if you follow all the rules, that's the evidence that you're a faithful person. And Paul comes in and says, no, 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 no. That's not it at all. Um, The evidence of faith is love. And Paul gives thanks to God that these Colossian believers are allowing the fruit of love to flow through them for the glory of God. And lastly, Paul mentions the virtue of hope. And, you know, some people think hope is the same as wishing. You know, some of us cross our fingers and say, oh, I I hope I get a new car for Christmas. No, that's wishing. That's not what hope is. That's Biblical hope, kind of like biblical faith, very, very strong word, okay? Hope is looking forward with eager expectation and a very, very strong confidence to the promises of God. Looking forward eagerly with confidence that God will fulfill his promises, right? Think about it. The pagans there in Colossae, um, prior to uh, coming to a knowledge of God, they had no hope because they had no God, right? But now that the gospel message has come to them through Epaphras, suddenly they have hope. They have hope in Jesus Christ, hope in a future and an eternity with God. But... Again, the false teachers that are there in Colossae, they are pushing against that idea of hope. And they're saying, no, 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 no. that's fleeting, that's failing, that's not going to last you. you. There's a lot more to this. You have to work and work and work to get to that place. And Paul makes it clear that your hope, my hope, is laid up for us in heaven. And that term laid up means reserved. It is up there, it is set aside, and nothing and nobody can take it away from us, okay? Paul is thankful to God that the believers are holding on tightly to their hope in spite of all the difficult circumstances and the pressures that are coming against them. And Paul again combats the false teachers by saying that the gospel is truth as opposed to what they're teaching, which is not truth. And he says, the gospel is truth, and I know that you believe it 
and it's spreading all around the world. And the reason I know you, that you believe it is Epaphras has told me of the fruit, the love that is being produced in your life, in your community there in Colossae. It's, you're living it out. The believers in Colossae were leading lives that were pleasing to the Lord. Ladies, the truth of the gospel should do the exact same thing in each of our lives. It should be transforming. It should transform the way you live your life. So the question there, is there evidence of his truth in your life? Is your life pleasing to the Lord? Are you walking in a manner that is worthy of the Lord? So Paul began the letter with a prayer of thanksgiving. And that prayer really reminded the Colossians of the transformed lives as a result of having come to faith in Jesus Christ. And now in verse 9, we're going to see he's going to say another prayer. And this prayer moves from thanksgiving more to intercession. And he prays that these believers would know God's will. But not just that they would know God's will. But they would allow God's will, they would allow the power to change their lives. And they would begin living for the Lord. Let's look verses 9 through 10. And so from the, that day that we heard, so Paul is saying, from the day that we heard that you were faithful believers... We, me and Timothy, have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. So it's so interesting. These words, wisdom, understanding, spiritual knowledge, these were all buzzwords of the day that the false teachers would use. Because remember, Gnostics are all about knowledge, right? And so they would use all these words. So I love that Paul comes in here and uses their exact same vocabulary, and he, but he uses it in a very different way. He says in his prayer, um, he wants these faithful people in Colossae to know that there is only one source of wisdom, one source of true knowledge, and that is God. Now, I'll be honest with y'all. I had never really studied this prayer before. And so this was kind of, I had read it, but I'd never really studied it before. But this is my, one of my new favorite prayers for believers. Now, this is not a prayer for a non-believer because this is obviously speaking to people who are in a relationship who have faith in Christ. But this is a, such a beautiful prayer because what is more important than trying to discern God's will and do it in your life? So this is my new favorite prayer. I've been praying this for y'all all week as I've been praying it for myself and my family members. But let's, So let's look at this prayer just real quickly here. Um, Paul wants the Colossians and us to know God's will and to allow that knowledge to affect every decision, every choice that we make, how we live our lives. And so how better are we going to know God's will? But we got to listen to God, right? But how many times when we go to God in prayer, do we spend 99% of the time talking and not very much time listening? So we need to learn how to listen to God rather than just talking all the time. You know, we need to learn to, it, that our prayers are not about making God listen to us, but rather it's us learning how to listen to God, right? In prayer, we're not trying to persuade God to do something but we should be trying to find out what he wants us to do, right? So often, not in the words, because I'm not going to say this, but in my actions, so often I say, not your will be done, thy will be done, but my will be done. Because <laughs> that's what we want. We want our will to be done, right? So the first thing we can learn from Paul about prayer is we need to listen more and talk less. That's what I learned. <laughs> that's a big thing I learned this week. God's, or Paul says, I pray that you be filled with the knowledge of God's will. That word filled there means to be complete, to be fully equipped. So he, he's praying that we will be fully equipped with the knowledge of God's will. And here's the key. God isn't in heaven saying, I've got my will and I might share it with you and I might not. No, God wants us to know his will. Right? He wants us to know it. And he has given us, his, I mean, his general will, it is spelled out in Scripture. That's what this book is all about, God's will. Right? Now, the specific will for your life or your prayers, the specific will of God, 
the way we discern that is it has to line up with this, right? So if, if for instance, we say, okay, oh, well, I'm really unhappy in my marriage and there's this guy I'm talking with on the internet and I, is it your will, God, that I should, you know, get involved with it? Of course that's not God's will, right? That, no, it doesn't line up with scripture, okay? You're trying to discern God's will, it must line up with scripture, Okay? The better we know God's word, the easier it is to discern his will. There's a shameless plug for signing up for Bible study. (laughs) Sign up for Bible study and we'll all study God's word together and we'll be able to discern God's will a little bit easier. So how can we grow in the knowledge and understanding of God's will? Well, Paul says there's one way and that's through spiritual insight, through inviting the Holy Spirit to teach us. Um, And when we talk about spiritual wisdom, we're not just talking about head knowledge because anybody can read the Bible and and learn what the Bible says. Satan knows what the Bible says, okay? Um, Being controlled by God means that a believer will understand the spiritual principles of Scripture and then put into practice, live it out every single day of our lives. So in this case, we have this slide. Um, wisdom refers to the comprehension of truth, while understanding refers to the application of truth. Spiritual intelligence is the beginning of a successful, fruitful Christian life. And in a Christian life, there is a dir- direct connection between learning and living. There has to be. There's always a connection there. For the believer, knowledge and obedience need to go hand in hand. And the result is fruit fruit is produced for the glory and honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Warren Wiersbe says, um, I just love this quote, um, that uh, he summarizes the Christian life as walk and work. He says, the sequence is important. First, there's wisdom, then walk, then work. And he says, I cannot work for God unless I am walking with him, but I cannot walk with him if I am ignorant of his will. So, I've gone long. I saw, I'm sorry. Well, I'm not being obedient. Sorry. Will you choose to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord? Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you um, for these scriptures. I pray that each of these ladies will be filled with the knowledge of your will, will be filled with all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that she can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, bearing fruit in every good work. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have any questions about registration, Lori will be right down here and she can answer you. We've got some visitors' cards also. Um, Y'all have a great week.